There was a time when the concept of armed helicopters was considered absurd. That time was before the Vietnam War. This is the story of how men and machinery adapted to the peculiar needs of unconventional warfare to produce a most unusual and deadly weapon system, the helicopter gunship. It is the story of how the missions of these gunships expanded from one of softening a landing zone in preparation of an infantry assault to one of entirely eliminating enemy resistance from the air. And it is the story of how, in less than a decade, the theory of armed helicopters moved from rudimentary makeshift designs to one of the most advanced and potent weapon systems of the day, the Huey Cobra. In December of 1961, the U.S. began deploying its first Army aviation units to South Vietnam. These units were sent to bolster South Vietnamese forces who were struggling to combat a communist war of insurgency mounted by Viet Cong guerrillas. The flight crews of these early forces were equipped with dozens of Piasecki H-21 Shawnee transport helicopters, also known as workhorses. Their mission was to ferry South Vietnamese troops into battle. The idea was to offset the guerrillas' ability to exploit the jungle environment with great skill, to freely wage a widespread campaign of terror in remote, difficult terrain by rapidly inserting troops into areas of recent Viet Cong activity. This relatively new approach to battle seemed promising. However, the Viet Cong quickly realized that the large, slow-moving, and unarmed transports were extremely vulnerable to ground fire. The downing of several Shawnees rapidly led to the employment of fighter escorts for the transports. However, the mismatch in airspeed often left the vulnerable transport crews uncovered at the worst possible moments of an operation. As a result, the U.S. Army began exploring the concept of armed helicopters with great interest in mid-1962. During the mid-1950s, a small group of pioneering Army aviators conducted a series of crude experiments with armed helicopters. Scrounging scrap materials from service junkyards, they improvised various combinations of rockets and machine guns in the face of outright ridicule and opposition. At the same time, they began developing tactics with the idea that, in time, the technology of helicopter armament would catch up to the theory. By mid-1957, the men had successfully armed several helicopters with a variety of unlikely weapons and had formed a Skycav platoon which became notorious for dramatic demonstrations of reconnaissance by fire. Building on these pioneering efforts, the Army formed the Utility Tactical Transport Helicopter Company and deployed it to Vietnam in mid-1962. The company was equipped with 15 A-model Bell UH-1s, otherwise known as Hueys. Each Huey had a pair of 30 caliber machine guns mounted on the landing skids. Ammunition for the guns was fed through a pair of holes cut in the cabin floor. This simple fixed gun system required the pilot to maneuver the aircraft in order to place fire on target. The most lethal aspect of these early gunships was the addition of 16 2.75 inch folding fin rockets. While the A-model Hueys represent a dramatic new force in Army weaponry, they merely represented the first step in a rapid evolution process that would produce some of the most potent weapon systems of all time. In less than six months, the UTT began receiving more powerful B-model Hueys. The most dramatic modification to these new gunships was the addition of a factory-installed M60 flex gun system. Two 7.62 millimeter machine guns were mounted on mechanical arms that stuck out from the Huey's fuselage. Flexible ammunition chutes fed thousands of rounds to all four guns from inside the aircraft's cabin, 
The system was controlled remotely by the co-pilot, who sat in the front left seat. The guns were electronically linked to a pistol grip sight that dropped down from the ceiling. As the co-pilot tracked targets with the sight, the guns instantaneously responded, traversing 70 degrees right and left and up and down. In the short span of several months, the Huey was transformed from a common utility helicopter to a lethal attacking force. The timing couldn't have been better for the American transport crews and their Vietnamese Army cargo. As the U.S. advisory and support roles expanded rapidly, the Viet Cong increased the scope and intensity of their operations and developed sophisticated tactics for countering threats posed by air mobile forces. Each day, gunships from the provisional UTT helicopter company set out from Tonsonut Air Base on the outskirts of Saigon to support the day's operations. Throughout the day, the teams would join up with transportation companies throughout the country as they prepared for an airborne assault. The test unit had a dual mission during these early operations. While they were fighting a real war and providing cover for the transports, their performance was scrutinized to evaluate the armed helicopter in the escort role. While not clearly defined, gunship crews quickly realized that the escort mission broke down into three critical phases. During the initial, or en route phase, the entire flight remained at a relatively safe altitude, roughly 2,000 feet. If enemy ground fire was spotted, the gunships could break off from the formation to attack. However, the heavily laden gunships could rarely overtake the air mobile force once they broke off. During the approach phase, a reconnaissance element of two to four armed helicopters preceded the flight by one to five minutes to evaluate the situation up ahead. The remaining escorts usually flanked the transports in a trail formation. If additional armed ships were available, they flew behind the transports to engage any enemy threats directly under the flight. As the gunships approached the LZ, the pilots scanned the terrain for potential enemy threats poised to fire at the first sign of trouble. Behind them, a crew chief and an additional door gunner ensured that no enemy fire emerged from the sides or soft underbelly of the vulnerable flight. Initially, gunship crews were restricted from firing unless the flight had clearly been fired upon. While the restriction was intended to prevent accidental civilian casualties, it also posed an enormous threat for the airborne force. The Viet Cong often waited until the vulnerable lift ships were actually in the LZ before opening fire. By February of 1963, the rules had been modified to allow for fire when an enemy threat had clearly been identified. This subtle distinction allowed gun crews to probe potential enemy positions with rockets and gun runs before insurgent forces struck. It was during the third and final stage of troop insertion the landing zone phase that armed helicopters proved to be most valuable. Once on the ground, the transport crews became sitting ducks. Difficult terrain frequently slowed the disembarking of troops. In the Delta, water was often chest deep, and the ships had to hover with their skids just beneath the water. The ground troops had to concentrate on getting out of the choppers and into safer positions around the LZ. Enemy gunners could tear into the entire force at any moment. Throughout the critical moments in the LZ, the crews of the armed helicopters circled the area, anxiously monitoring radio traffic and scanning the tree lines for signs of trouble. Frequently, the transports would report taking enemy fire before the gunship crews could see it. Once a Viet Cong gun position was pinpointed, the gunships immediately rolled in to lay down suppressive fire. While many had questioned the potential vulnerability of armed helicopters in combat, few could have appreciated the sight of a Huey thundering to the earth with four machine guns blazing and a rapid succession of rockets streaking to the ground. The armed helicopters of the UTT proved to be highly effective in reducing both the amount and accuracy of enemy fire placed on transports. Although Viet Cong attacks on unarmed helicopters continued to mount, the number of successful strikes against escorted aircraft dropped 
dramatically. Throughout the early 1960s, U.S. air mobile assistance to South Vietnam continued to expand and became a key factor in the government's ability to combat communist insurgency. The advent of the armed helicopter came to play a critical role in the success of these early air mobile operations. However, by mid-1965, despite a large commitment of U.S. air mobile resources, the situation in South Vietnam continued to deteriorate. In the fall of 1965, the United States began committing large ground forces to Vietnam in an attempt to stem the tide of communist warfare. By then, hundreds of Hueys had replaced the H-21s in the troop transport role, and the concept of air mobility had come to dominate the mode of battle in Vietnam. It was during this period that the missions of armed helicopters began to expand dramatically beyond the escort role. The combination of thousands of U.S. combat forces and hundreds of Hueys led to massive air assaults in which U.S. ground troops took on the role of tracking down and engaging enemy forces. During larger operations, multiple gun platoons, each containing as many as eight gunships, escorted flights of unarmed Hueys, or slicks, into areas of suspected Viet Cong activity. Air Force fighters normally prepped the landing zone in advance of the flight with a variety of bombs and rockets. As soon as the Air Force had peeled off, several gunship teams would roll into the LZ to further soften up the area. As opposed to the early days when gun crews were restricted from firing until fired upon, these advanced elements usually emptied their ammunition in and around the LZ in hopes of preventing an ambush. As the slicks came into land, additional gunship teams circled in racetrack patterns on both sides of the flight to ensure that the vulnerable transports were not assaulted while in the LZ. While these tactics were similar to those employed by the UTT, the greatest difference began to unfold after the slicks departed the LZ. Early on, gunships were generally limited to firing one minute before the transports had landed and one minute after the last departed. Initially, fire support for troops on the ground was to be provided by less vulnerable fighter aircraft. However, Viet Cong ambushes became a significant problem. Many units were locked in bitter firefights from the moment they dispersed into the LZ. As a result, additional gunship teams generally remained on station to provide close support. During this new and unusual form of combat, gunship crews often engaged enemy troops just meters from friendly positions in a frantic attempt to prevent disaster. It was an organized, hectic, chaotic place, is the best I can say. If we we're really in, involved, you might be taking fire, or you're, you're the person or people that you were supporting might be taking fire. The crew chief and gunner both had machine guns, both on the bungee cord, uh, and both could uh, suspend themselves uh, out of the door of the aircraft, and they would generally mark a target if they saw it with, uh, with smoke grenade, but they would keep a... a a target suppressed with their machine gun fire. Uh, the crew chief uh, and, and gunner had a tendency to fire awful close to the back of the pilot or the co-pilot, generally the co-pilot, and you might find one of the shell clippings going down uh, your back, uh, and uh, that can give you a little consternation also, thinking that you're hit, and it's only a, a shell, expended shell coming out of the crew chief's gun. The extremely close range of suppressive fire from gunships often meant the difference between life and death for entire platoons. Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops frequently established multiple, well-concealed gun emplacements around likely allied insertion points. 
Deadly crossfire from unknown positions pinned many units down before they could even establish a defensive perimeter. During these desperate situations, multiple teams of armed helicopters took turns making firing passes to maintain pressure on enemy gunners. Normally, as one crew rolled in, another followed slightly behind and above to put suppressive fire beneath the lead ship as it broke away from the target. Enemy gunners quickly realized that once a gunship made its break, it had little capability to defend against fire from below or behind. Though the heavily laden gunships were not especially maneuverable, many pilots developed risky but effective tactics to avoid lethal ground fire. Uh, our biggest uh, deterrent, uh, not to get shot, I guess, was to fly low. In other words, you put your skids in the trees. Uh, and when you did that, uh, you were there and gone so quickly that it was hard to draw, draw a bead on you and shoot you. Uh, the most dangerous al altitude was somewhere around 2,000 feet, because now you're in uh, view of everything, but you're still within small arms range. So we flew all the time, just uh, you know, just right over the treetops. I mean, right in the treetops. Sometimes it wasn't unusual to come out and pick out, pick branches out of your skids. <laughs> you were that low. One of the greatest dangers of low altitude flight was the potential for target fixation. Some pilots became so focused on the urgency of placing fire accurately that they lost track of altitude and ground obstacles and ran into trees or even straight into the ground during firing runs. As a last resort, some gunship crews even risked their own lives to extract wounded or overwhelmed troops once their ammunition stores had run dry. The unique ability of gunships to provide close support rapidly expanded to include assistance for conventional ground units. Allied forces patrolling for Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops never knew when they would stumble into a major firefight. When heavy contact was made, ground units increasingly counted on available gunships to provide suppressive fire and to bolster the ground assault. The gunships essentially became an extension of, and even replaced, tube artillery support. Fire was generally controlled in the same manner as ground artillery with a forward observer marking positions with colored smoke and adjusting fire as necessary. We would uh, have a reference. Uh, if we didn't have a, a reference uh, from smoke, then it may be uh, a bend in the river or a certain pine tree in the middle of a field uh, to the left 500 yards or whatever it is. But uh, we use whatever was available as a reference point. And from the reference point, then you try to identify where you, uh, the, the, uh, the enemy was. And then you would uh, attack that position. Providing close support for troops in contact was one of the most challenging missions for gunship crews. Ground forces were often located in mountainous terrain and were concealed by dense jungle foliage. To make matters worse, spontaneous firefights often took place at extremely close range. Gunship crews had to be extremely careful in placing fire. The pinpoint accuracy of machine guns was often preferred over rockets and grenades, which could burst in the trees and lead to friendly casualties. The door gunner emerged as one of the greatest assets for troops locked in close battle. When rockets were employed, many pilots tried to approach in as steep a dive as the Huey would allow to prevent rounds from scattering throughout the area. The timely and powerful support of armed helicopters became a critical component of ground operations in Vietnam. Tube artillery was often out of range or couldn't be fired because of the close proximity of friendly positions to enemy forces. <laughs> 
Air Force fighters were often unavailable or were delayed in arriving on station. For infantrymen, the gunship became a lifeline. The ground troops were uh, really appreciative and uh, it could not have been a better rapport than they had with the, with the armed helicopter platoons and with, the, with aviation in general uh, because they realized that so many times uh, an armed gunship, if they were under attack, uh, maybe the only thing could get to them to uh, hopefully uh, suppress the enemy uh, guns that were, were firing on them. Even after a massive gunship assault, ground forces frequently faced intense opposition from hidden gun emplacements. To escape the intense barrage from above, enemy troops frequently sought refuge in underground tunnels and bunkers. The tunnels were a major factor in the communists' ability to survive bombing attacks, to appear and disappear at will, and to ambush unsuspecting Allied troops. While gunships could do significant damage to such structures, the grim task of clearing and destroying these fortifications could only be achieved by daring men on the ground. Throughout these dangerous operations, gunships usually remained nearby in case significant opposition re-emerged. Many communist troops remained in their fortifications and fought to the death rather than surrender. Perhaps the most unusual but potent armed helicopters developed during the Vietnam War were a series of armed CH-47 Chinooks, known as Go-Go Birds. Three of these massive gunships were tested by the 1st Cavalry Division in 1966 under an effort to find a suitable follow-on to the Huey. Each Go-Go could be configured with a wide variety of powerful weapon systems. The primary armament consisted of a 40 millimeter grenade launcher located in a turret under the nose, a pair of 20 millimeter cannon mounted on stub wings, and either two 19 shot rocket pods or two miniguns that could fire up to 3,000 rounds a minute. Five crew served 50 caliber machine guns were also positioned throughout the aircraft. A number of Chinooks were also employed as ad hoc bombers during the war to destroy underground fortifications and tunnel systems. During these operations, 55-gallon drums of tear gas were rolled out the back of the Chinook to drive the Viet Cong above ground. Napalm was also rigged and dropped in the same manner on targets that resisted all other attempts to drive enemy forces out. A single Chinook could drop as much as two and a half tons of napalm on a single target. The Go-Go Bird, however, generally performed more traditional close support missions for troops in contact. While far from graceful or maneuverable, they had a tremendous morale effect on the infantry, who often specifically called for Go-Go gun support. From the infantryman's point of view, when a go-go appeared, enemy forces quickly disappeared. Crews of these aircraft performed incredibly heroic missions to prove the gunship's worth in combat. The mix of weapons, the heavy volume of firepower, and incredible endurance allowed the go-go's to neutralize every enemy position attacked during the evaluation period. Ultimately, the program was canceled because Chinooks were desperately needed for air transport and because a new purpose-built attack helicopter was on its way to Vietnam. While the concept of these super gunships would be debated for years, few infantrymen who received support from the Go-Go Bird would ever forget it. Initially, most gunship missions focused on escorting air mobile forces or providing close support for troops on the ground. However, as the war progressed, a wide variety of reconnaissance, 
security and attack missions evolved in response to widespread Viet Cong threats throughout South Vietnam. In the southern part of the country, Army gun platoons and a Navy helicopter attack squadron, known as the Sea Wolves, operated in and around Saigon and throughout the Mekong Delta. One of the primary missions of these units was to provide reconnaissance and fire support for Navy SEALs and river patrol boats as they attempted to stop the flow of Viet Cong supplies entering the country by water. Other missions included armed escort for Allied ships navigating the dangerous waterways leading to the ports of Saigon. Much of the time, however, the fire teams scoured hundreds of square miles throughout the Delta, searching for ambush sites and general targets of opportunity. Surprisingly, the Viet Cong operated extensively throughout the region and could conceal themselves extremely well in the dense grasses and nipa palm of the marshy wetlands. Extensive tunnel networks were even created to provide shelter from Allied airstrikes. Gunships were especially prone to ground fire in these flat, open areas. Many crewmen were shot in the legs or even up through the seat as they made low firing runs. The unrestricted visibility and potent accuracy of door gunners was critical to defense against enemy ground fire. The Viet Cong who generally associated all gunships with the original utility tactical transport company, despised the powerful gunships and often tried to lure them into deadly traps. On several occasions, the Viet Cong would come up on our frequencies and say, ah, you know, American UTT, uh, we, we see you. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's, where, here's where we are. Come, uh, come see if you can uh, get us. Or sometimes not telling us who they were, but saying uh, they were a Vietnamese uh, uh, compound in, in distress and needed help. And would you come to these coordinates? We were always very leery because if we uh, responded, they usually had 50s or some type of air defense gun uh, set up in, the, in those areas. While various configurations of armed Hueys were effectively used in a variety of missions throughout the war, one particular breed of gunship stood apart from all the rest, the gunships of the Aerial Rocket Artillery, more commonly known as the ARA. Most gunships primarily provided light fire support rather than artillery type force. The ARA, by contrast, was organized and employed as artillery. Each gunship carried a devastating load of 48 rockets. To the troops on the ground, this potent configuration was known as the hog. ARA support was frequently called in by forward artillery observers when ground-based artillery proved insufficient for the task at hand. This innovative force provided ground units with an incredible capability to quickly and accurately place tremendous firepower on enemy positions. When you have a regular gunship, you know, you're limited to uh, your rocket, your 2.75s. Uh, you only have uh, 14 of them. When you bring your hog in, you're really going to do some damage to somebody with uh, uh, 48 uh, rockets. And so it, it's sort of like if you got an emplacement or if you got something heavy that you want to tear up, in that sense, you, you bring a hog in. Because ARA gunships generally served as an extension of a ground artillery force, the fire teams received all of their directions from the forward ground observer. The crews normally worked in teams and took turns rotating over targets to maintain constant pressure on the enemy. The ARA was never intended to replace ground artillery, but the careful allocation and precise timing of this force in combat provided incredible volumes of fire in places and times when no other support was available. During larger offensive operations, the ARA remained on the ground a short distance from ground forces, but kept one section of gunships on a two-minute alert status. When the call for fire support went out, the section was airborne within two minutes and heading for the target. Once the first section had departed, a second and a third section entered five-minute and two-minute alert status. 
As the crews expended their rockets, they would return to base, hot rearm, and begin the cycle again. In this manner, a continuous barrage of artillery could remain on target for as long as needed. In the Delta, ARA crews were often sent in to destroy well-hidden enemy bunker complexes. The structures were fortified with layers of mud and logs and were virtually impervious to standoff attacks. The hogs, however, could dive in extremely close to these fortifications and rapidly place dozens of rockets with pinpoint accuracy. All gunship crews had to be extremely careful when firing rockets at low level. Mud from the blasts could easily knock out the Huey's windshield or chin bubble. Or worse, flying debris could damage the rotors and bring the entire crew down. The creation of an aerial artillery force proved to be one of the most significant tactical developments of the war. The ability of these crews to get extremely close to forward positions and to actually see and respond to the situation on the ground helped to offset communist guerrilla tactics and saved the lives of countless Allied infantrymen. Initially, the opportunity to fly heavily armed choppers was an intense and thrilling adventure for most gunship pilots. Some pilots were fresh out of flight school, had spent up to nine months in training, and were elated to be practicing their new profession, even if it was in Vietnam. However, in time, the strains of combat flying often began to affect even the most enthusiastic aviators. Once you were in country and flying for a little while, you, you began to feel the war. You, you see your buddies die, uh, you see aircraft shot down, uh, you receive bullets yourself, not to your body, but uh, to the aircraft. And, and you're wondering about these mixed emotions. Here I am enjoying what I'm doing, and I'm in a war. And that's not natural in that, in that sense. And so it gives you, uh, it gives you a lot of time to, uh, to search your soul. Throughout the Vietnam War, armed helicopters served as one of the most effective defensive measures against deadly mortar and rocket attacks launched by the Viet Cong. Some of the most notable fire support was provided by the famed Razorback gun platoon, which served as the palace guards for the capital city of Saigon. The crews of this platoon remained in a constant state of battle readiness for much of the war. We would have uh, one crew uh, sleeping by the aircraft and on immediate uh, notice uh, if they were if they got incoming uh, mortars at, in, at night or such. Then we had another crew that was on 30 minute uh, standby and then a third crew that was on an hour standby. If they uh, started getting attacks in the local area around Saigon or they started mortaring Saigon, we would immediately go out and try to, to silence these mortars. On January 31st, 1967, the capabilities of the Razorbacks and other gun platoons located near Saigon were put to the test when communist forces launched their massive Tet Offensive. 35 enemy battalions marched on the capital, attacking various military and civilian facilities. Viet Cong commandos even penetrated the U.S. Embassy compound. Allied forces engaged the communists in dozens of fierce battles. Firefights erupted along numerous streets and alleyways. In these tight quarters, armed helicopters repeatedly demonstrated their unique ability to provide extremely close support by placing suppressive rounds within meters of friendly positions. Throughout the offensive, gunships patrolled the skies over Saigon, searching for signs of enemy activity and responding to calls for help. Some of the most significant fighting took place at Tonsonut Air Base, located just outside the city. More than 700 communist soldiers launched an all-out attack to take the airfield, which also served as a major U.S. command center. The communists breached the base's perimeter without firing a shot and came within 1,000 feet of the runways before they were halted in eight hours of bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
Within three minutes of the alert that Tansanut was under attack, two Razorback fire teams were airborne in attacking the enemy. In one instance, a ground patrol of 30 men ran head-on into a 350-man attack force. Gunships immediately responded and managed to save the patrol by placing a barrage of rockets in the middle of the enemy's position. More than 200 enemy troops were killed during the engagement, most by the lethal fire of the gunships. The quick reaction of the armed helicopters undoubtedly saved Tan Sanut from serious danger of being overrun. During the initial hours of the attack, the gunships were the only aircraft that could get airborne. While the scope of the Tet Offensive was shocking, it actually amounted to a large-scale military defeat for the communists. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army lost some 45,000 men in battles across the country. Gunship crews repeatedly played a major role in the communist defeat and prevented countless civilian and military casualties in the process. In spite of the impressive record of early armed Hueys, the aircraft was never intended for the gunship role. As a result, it suffered from many deficiencies. In 1968, the capability of gunship crews would forever change with the introduction of the world's first purpose-built attack helicopter, the Bell AH-1 Huey Cobra. A two-man team operated the Cobra in a unique arrangement that placed a gunner in the nose of the aircraft and the pilot slightly above and behind him to increase combat visibility. The gunner controlled weapon systems mounted in a movable chin turret under the nose. The pilot flew the aircraft and controlled any weapons that were mounted on a pair of stub wings. The heart of the Cobra was the rotor, engine, and drive system of the old Huey, but the rest was a revolution. Design work began in early 1965 as a company funded Bell Venture to replace the Huey. Incredibly, by August of 1967, the first Cobras were arriving in Vietnam. These powerful attack birds carried up to 52 rockets in side-mounted pods and could be armed with various configurations of mini guns, 40 millimeter grenade launchers and even 20 millimeter cannons. The Cobra's most significant advantages were realized in the original mission of armed helicopters, providing escort support for air mobile operations. Heavily laden Huey gunships struggled to keep pace with the lighter unarmed slicks. The Cobras, however, could literally fly circles around troop transports. They had a cruising speed of 160 miles per hour compared to 90 for the older Hueys. Such speed allowed Cobra crews a tremendous amount of flexibility in conducting reconnaissance and responding to enemy threats during an insertion. This in turn resulted in greater security for the entire force. While the Cobra's speed, maneuverability, and armament were assets to the escort mission, these same characteristics initiated a new era for armed helicopters. For the first time, significant surprise attacks on ground targets became possible. To American forces, the Cobra became known as the Snake. For the Viet Cong, it was the Whispering Death. Diving in from altitude, the Cobra could reach speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour. Such speed, combined with the fact that the fuselage was only 36 inches wide, precluded enemy forces from even seeing incoming attacks, let alone defending against them. Enemy forces quickly learned that firing on a Cobra merely exposed one's position and generally resulted in a devastating barrage of machine gun and rocket fire. The Cobra's unique tandem configuration required tremendous teamwork to operate. Crews had to perform as an integrated unit and came to depend heavily on one another in combat. Many teams stayed together for months on end. 
crews generally and, and fire teams generally want to stay together for some period of time because you get used to uh, working with each other and you can anticipate what your uh, your other crew is going to do or what the other uh, the man in your cockpit is going to do and it's especially important if you get into uh, say an unexpected situation uh, you know you start taking fire from a certain direction yeah, you know who's supposed to do what who's going to go in after the guy who's going to come around and cover or whether you're both going to engage the target at the same time. If necessary, the crew of a single Cobra could engage multiple targets simultaneously. Such teamwork was an important aspect of day combat missions, but it became absolutely imperative at night. Cobra teams frequently flew at night to deny the guerrillas the ability to freely operate under cover of darkness. One of the more unusual missions involved support for Firefly operations. Fireflies were Hueys that had been modified to carry a set of C-123 landing lights in the door. During a typical mission, a Firefly would set out for a likely area of enemy activity. Once a Cobra or other fire support arrived on station, the Firefly began illuminating the terrain below with the searchlights. If a target was identified, the Firefly tried to fix the enemy with light until a Cobra could roll in to fire. Night missions were generally hazardous for all helicopter crews, but low-level firing runs at night were perhaps the most dangerous missions of all. At night, there we have a problem uh, with target fixation. Uh, the man in the back would go into a run and start, say, shooting, and you get so fixated on the target, you don't you lose sense of where you actually are, what altitude, what speed, and everything else. So the front seater also has to pay attention to the altitude, and if he uh, thinks something is going wrong, either talk to the man, or if he doesn't have time to talk, just get on the controls and start an immediate pullout. And uh, one night. I had to pull out of a dive at night, and we went through the treetops. You could hear them snapping, cracking, banging as we, as we uh, pulled out. Many crews were unable to recover from target fixation and were lost as they crashed into trees or steep hillsides. However, night illumination and strike missions proved to be extremely effective and a good tactic for taking back the night from communist guerrillas. As a result, Many more night observation systems were tested and employed in conjunction with gunship crews throughout the war. While the Huey Cobra was one of the most potent offensive innovations of the Vietnam War, it also emerged as the premier defender of ground forces. During the later stages of the conflict, numerous fire bases and other remote compounds became the target of massive communist assaults. When this occurred, the rapid response of Cobra fire teams was often the only thing that prevented friendly positions from being overrun. In some instances, fire teams continually rotated in every five to 10 minutes over a 24 hour period just to allow enough time for Allied troops to be extracted from the area. The one thing that fire teams feared most was having a position overrun while they were trying to defend it. The crews could usually see the men on the ground. In some units, they even knew who they were. The temptation to immediately unleash the full fury of the Cobra was hard to resist. Initially, you really want to help the troops on the ground because that's your job. Uh, but you have to restrain yourself and you have to find out exactly where they are. And when he starts adjusting you in close, he may give you a big jump. You just take a little one and you just uh, you gradually work yourself in because you don't want to hit the troops on the ground. Cobra fire teams carried a variety of weapon systems and had to carefully evaluate the situation on the ground before making a selection and firing. The Cobra was a much more stable and accurate firing platform than the old Huey gunships. Both crew members also had excellent visibility, which allowed them to place fire at incredibly close range. 
the minigun itself, we fired probably, some t in some cases, three to five meters out from friendlies. And of course, we're engaging from uh, relatively low altitudes. The uh, 40 millimeter uh, had a little bit bigger bursting radius, and you also could get tree bursts, so you had to use that a little bit further out. Uh, the rockets themselves had even a larger bursting radius. Uh, even though we did fire within five to ten meters of friendlies at some time, we had to be careful and we had to usually warn the ground troops. And they, when they called us in that close, uh, they didn't care about getting a little shrapnel over their head because things were, they were in a bind and they needed as, you know, as much close, very close support as they, uh, as they could. The close support provided by Cobra fire teams was often the decisive factor in driving back enemy assaults and prevented countless Allied casualties. Never was such a flexible, responsive, and accurate form of fire support needed more than in Vietnam, where there were no boundaries and there were no rules. Allied forces could stumble into a major battle at any time and in any place. The gunship crews became the infantry's lifeline. Our relationship with, uh, with the ground troops uh, was just uh, a camaraderie that uh, there's no way to explain it. It was just uh, uh, mutual admiration. Uh, compared to those uh, grunts on the ground, we had it easy uh, because we went back at night and we covered up, so to speak. Uh, we left those ground troops out there in the mud and they, had, uh, you know, they didn't know if they were going to live through the night or not and hoping we'd be back tomorrow. Uh, and, and at certain times, you know, we would come back and there would be, uh, where they'd been attacked the night before and, and dead bodies laying all over the, the edge of the Constantina perimeters and this type of thing. So, you know, uh, my hat's off to those guys. And uh, the rapport that we had, there's just no way to explain it. Throughout the Vietnam War, gunship crews fought hard to defend their comrades, and indeed all of South Vietnam against communist aggression. Their revolutionary capabilities emerged at a critical time in a war that demanded new and innovative approaches to combat. The introduction of the Huey Cobra capped an incredible effort to meet those demands and marked the dawn of an entirely new and potent breed of aircraft, the attack helicopter. In the end, the impact of gunship missions in Vietnam clearly validated the concept of armed helicopters and reshaped the face of air and ground warfare forever. <laughs>